So with that, my friends, I am now going to talk about, or I will endeavor to speak about this film in detail. So if you have not seen the film, I urge you to turn off this video now and watch the film. Once you've seen the film, please come back at any time. This video will still be here. And then you and I can have a conversation and we can talk about this great film. I would love to hear what you have to say and what you have to think about this truly awesome work of art. A brighter summer day. to rely on some notes that I've written up. So please forgive me if you hear the occasional uh, paper noise, but I'll try to keep the noise to a minimum. But I have to refer to some of my notes here while I speak because there is very much uh, that is going on here. So how shall we tackle this film? How should we tackle this film? And I've thought about this long and hard. And again, I'm not a scholar. I'm not a critic. I'm just trying to approach it in, uh, in the only way that I know how, which is just one-on-one -on -one in my own personal engagement with the work. So with that in mind, though, it's quite difficult for me to figure out exactly how to approach it. I suppose I could try to talk about it in terms of its significance in Taiwanese new cinema history. But as I said, that's something that I think the documentary on the Taiwan new cinema on the set does much better. And also Tony Rain's commentary does so much better. I suppose I could talk about it in terms of, of Edward Yang's filmography. And I think I could try to do that maybe later if I have the chance. But I think more importantly, and more impactfully, and more intimately from my point of view, I think I identify most with the characters in this film, and in particular, the character of Xiao Si. So this is the main character of the film played by Chen Cheng, and there is the, there are many aspects to his character that are being dealt with in this film. The fact that he is struggling at school, the fact that he is not necessarily excelling in his studies, the fact that he has certain friendships uh, that are, um, that have a, maybe a, a positive influence in his life and a not so positive influence in his life, and the fact that he is a son of mainland Chinese family who uh, escaped from the mainland and came to Taiwan uh, to follow the uh, Guomintang and the uh, and and to be a part of living in Taiwan, the Republic of China. So he is a part of this overall tension that seems to exist at this particular junction of Taiwan history that's being depicted here in this film, which is the uh, early 1960s, late 19, uh, 1959 to early 1960s. So this area. And remember, this is not soon, this is not far after the crucial year of 1949, very important in the context of Taiwan history. So with all this stuff on a very general level that's going on, I think the best way to approach this discussion of this work is to focus on Xiao Si the character of Xiao Si and his relationships with key characters in the film, namely his father and his other family members, his brother Lao Er, and also his sisters who come into play uh, uh, rather significantly later on in the film. 
and also Schauser's relationships with his friends at school who also are members of various gangs and in particular the Little Park Gang and his relationships with people who are members or quasi-members of that group and in particular um, um, uh, Little Cat and uh, his connection, his albeit brief connection with Honey and also with um, uh, Sly, who is a little bit of a of a turncoat towards the end there, um, and also there is the tension uh, that he is somewhat involved in, uh, because of the tension that exists in terms of the gangland uh, uh, rivalry between, in, as at least as as depicted in this film, the Little Park Gang on the one hand and the Two One Seven Gang on the other. So, this is a. Uh, uh, and also, we should say also that the 217 gang uh, has certain connections uh, with the uh, military, the uh, uh, kind of a lower, the lower class uh, levels of military personnel. So their children uh, are members of this 217 gang uh, because it refers to a certain area in which uh, the, the these military families lived. So, uh, and all of this. Uh, is set um, the, all this sets the stage for the uh, relationships uh, that trigger certain emotional reactions within Schelser himself and this is true especially with the interaction we, between him and his father and also the peripheral characters that are involved in that key relationship and also the key relationship is Schelser's relationship with women and in particular, um, uh, Ming, the young woman who is at the center of this film in a very, uh, in a very almost, uh, how should I put it? She is the elusive center of the film in many ways, or at least I should say sh what the conception of her character is from the viewpoint of the men in this film forms the elusive center of the film. And I think that's a key distinction because she is much more than meets the eye. And she is much more nuanced and much more complex as a character, as a human being, than meets the eye. So this is the general baggage that accompanies this work in the context of Chaucer. So I think we should talk about Chaucer in the context of his relationships with other characters and also the symbolism that occurs with respect to his character throughout the film. And this is how Edward Yang treats him. So the symbolism of things like his eyesight, uh, the flashlight, the bat, um, the, uh, uh, the knife, uh, the, the picture of, the, of the, the Japanese woman that they find and, and all these other little things that appear and, and pop up that create certain currents and ripples that uh, uh, fluctuate. Uh, they start on one point and they fluctuate throughout the entire narrative uh, chronology until they tend to exponentially grow into some kind of arc that reaches a, a, a crisis point or climax point some, what, uh, somehow later in the, in the narrative. So everything has a certain interne interconnectivity that's going on. Um, so and it all comes down to the, uh, the, the character of Shao Sir. So I think we should focus our attention and our discussion to that of Shao Sir. And let's see if we can come up with something interesting here. And again, if I fail in my attempts to comment here, again, I truly apologize. But this is a very intimidating work from my point of view. And I have to just do my very best here. Okay, so the character of Shao Sir is the key character in the film, obviously. And what can we say about him? Uh, he is a character that is undergoing a lot of uh, stress and turmoil, I would say. He is young. He is youthful. He is very likable. And he's very, I would say, uh, uh, somewhat uh, charismatic. He's a bit of a loner. And he is usually off by himself, so to speak. And this is evident, I think, on the fore by the fact that he is not 
officially a member of the Little Park Gang. Right? He is friends with members of the Little Park Gang, but he is not officially a member of that gang. So that's a very important point. And I think his sort of loner status makes him an attractive uh, companion or uh, it makes him very attractive and makes uh, him, uh, uh, well, it makes people, certain people like the character of Ma, uh, who is the, uh, the student that comes uh, later in the film, and he is uh, of a wealthy military family. And Ma and uh, Schauser have a little relationship, a, French, a friendship that becomes very complicated as the film progresses to its climax. And also, uh, Schauser's sort of loner status uh, tends to attract also the attention of Honey, who is the uh, leader of the Little Park Gang who is on the run. And we don't see him at the start of the film because he's on the run. And uh, we, I, we get the information that he is somehow um, uh, hiding in the southern part of Taiwan, Tainan area. And we see him later in the film as he emerges. And uh, so... This all shows that Shao Sir is a little bit uh, to himself, but he does have friends. And this, I think, is emblematic also of the fact that his father, too, uh, tends to be a little bit of uh, a loner, somewhat standoffish. We can see his father struggling, for instance, with the relationship that his family has with Uncle Fat and Uncle Fat's store. And I think this is a very important relationship because, because Uncle Fat, as uh, we discover, is a native, native Taiwan person. And the father and the family is, of course, from the mainland. So there's automatically a, an assumed tension between them. Of course, the tension between Uncle Fat and the father stems at least on the immediate forefront uh, due to the fact that it seems like Uncle Fat is jealous that the, uh, the Chen family's um, uh, elder daughter has gotten into university while Uncle Fat's daughter uh, was not able to get into a good university. So there seems to be a little, of a little bit of a rivalry. But at the same time, there seems also to be uh, a little bit of a financial difference. Uncle Fat seems to be a little bit more well off than the Chang family. So uh, there is an inherent tension that is uh, being generated here. Uncle Fat representing, quote unquote, the native Taiwanese aspect, I think, whereas the uh, father representing the mainland uh, Chinese who came uh, post or who came 1949 and after. So we can see, therefore, that this tension uh, that exists seems to be mirrored automatically uh, within the very heart of Schauser himself. So we can imagine the kind of tension, uh, whether it be something that is known to his character or not, something that's more subliminal perhaps, it's still there. So uh, I, it, it's, it's hard for me to fathom just the, what kind of, of, of feeling that must have been. Now, I, I don't know what that means exactly. I, I, I mean, I don't think people are living on edge every time, but there is a certain unease that's going on and this could have something to do with the fact that this is um, there is a certain displacement that's going on. Uh, there is a certain tension in terms of the military presence in Taiwan that's going on. Uh, remember, this is uh, again after um, uh, 19, the events of 1947 and 1949, and we still have, and this is uh, during a time of of um, martial law and also a time of what's known as the white terror. So we do have uh, aspects of uh, authoritarianism at play, militarism at play, uh, and how that affects the uh, psyche and the characters of these uh, particular people, and in particular the father. Uh, but that idea of authority uh, and the uh, the threat of being oppressed is also at play in Shao Sir's life as well because of his interactions with the people at school and also other authority figures in his life. So there is a lot of mirroring going on between Shao Sir on the one hand and his father on the other hand. So this is all to say, I think, that Shao Sir within him is a man or a young boy of many dimensions, I think, uh, that are so uh, inextricably tied on the one hand, we have his own emotions 
and his own interactions as a, as a young boy, as a youth, just growing up and just trying to enjoy himself, study, get by, have fun, fall in love, um, get to know more people and all that, and also his family life. But that's so inextricably linked with the general tension that is at play in this film as it's depicting Taiwan at this particular time in the 1960s. So uh, this is, again, another example of Edward Yang and the way in which he is reaching out in so many ways on so many different dimensions and levels that it is, I think, something that is so remarkable and so beyond me. Um, but there you have it. So that is Shao Sir at least uh, uh, taking into consideration how his father seems to be affecting his life. And of course, as the film progresses, we have certain uh, very critical events that occur in Shao Sir's life that seems to mirror critical events that happen in his father's life, right? Because the father has a certain relationship with the character of Wang, who's played by the character actor uh, Su Ming. Uh, and we saw Su Ming in other Edward Yang films in the past. Remember the film um, That Day on the Beach, uh, At Sai, the very famous, uh, very charismatic character in that film. Well, here he plays Wang. And so uh, there is a, a, a tension because it seems like um, the father is somewhat unwilling to try to take advantage of 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 uh, the the connections and he's having trouble taking advantage of what's known as guangxi so uh, there is a little bit of a financial uh, maybe financial duress that's placed on the family it looks like they are not necessarily really well off they're not so struggling but it seems to be a little bit tight in terms of money but of course this escalates because of course later on we find that he is the subject of some pretty scary intimidating interrogation by the authorities and so there's a period uh, later in the film where he is taken away and over uh, a period of of some number of days he is interrogated quite fiercely and the impl the the suggestion is that it has something to do with his uh, quote-unquote potential communist ties that stem from his relationship with a certain figure that is mentioned, uh, Professor Xia. And this is uh, uh, a reference made early in the film when the, uh, when the Chang family are visiting uh, Mr. Wang uh, in his very uh, big house. And uh, Wang, incidentally, is a character who's married and the wife is played by uh, Tsai Chin. Uh, who's uh, featured very briefly early on, and then we don't see her again. But during this time, we get uh, a little uh, we we get a little story about Professor Shaw from Mrs. Shaw. So Professor Shaw was probably someone who was had very close ties with the father, and Professor Shaw uh, decided to go back to mainland and left his wife behind here in Taiwan. And the implication being it was part of the so-called uh, 100 Flowers campaign on the mainland. Uh, but also the implication is that Professor Shaw probably fell victim uh, to the eventual persecution that took place during that campaign uh, for uh, quote-unquote dissidents who decided to return to the mainland. So this is probably uh, the, uh, uh, the genesis of whatever suspicions of quote-unquote communist ties that the father may have, which brings about his um, very fierce and uh, quite, quite disturbing uh, interrogation scenes. So the idea, therefore, is that, um, uh, uh, right, the, uh, from the very outset, the father is always seemingly uh, struggling against something. He is resisting against something. And it really comes to a, a head with respect to the authorities. And then it's at this point later in the film where he is broken. Well, this is running parallel, of course, with Shao Sir's uh, story arc, right? Because Shao Sir is seemingly struggling against the authorities as represented by the school. 
at the very outset we realize that he uh, is not doing well and so he has to go to night school and so that's already something against him and there doesn't seem to be that much encouragement uh, he's not believed he's treated as a bit of a delinquent and uh, so therefore this, the principal and the staff uh, seem to represent the authority that is uh, somehow meeting out these acts of injustice uh, scenes that from our eyes and I think from Chaucer's eyes are things that are unfair so uh, this is obviously a parallel with the father's story and it reaches a a, a climax a critical climax uh, in terms of of uh, the explosive nature uh, how Chaucer seems to be lashing out against authority and so this is a lovely parallel uh, right because just at the point later in the film where the father seems to be collapsing against the pressures of authority this is the exact point where Chaucer seems to be trying to lash out against what he sees as the oppressive nature of the authority in his world so uh, and that could be a reaction or a natural inclination towards resistance that uh, the father failed to do in the end so there is a wonderful parallel and counter active nature uh, that is going on between the story arc of the father and the story arc of the son that uh, tend to intertwine and go parallel in some aspects and then shoot off into completely different results in other areas and I think ultimately it's it it leads to Chaucer's undoing and his uh, tragic downfall because while the father seems to be uh, broken to the point of just passive acquiescence and uh, just uh, uh, resignation to his fate in a way that is I think very haunting but it's also something that uh, leads to basically him being able to come back to his family and lead whatever ex existence that he can with his family. For Chaucer it's obviously very different because in his own way he decides to rebel. Right? He decides to rebel and where does that leave him? Of course it leaves him uh, with a very uh, troubled state of mind both emotionally and psychologically and also it, it leads him to get much confusion and to the point where he does something that is truly, truly terrible. He kills Ming. So there is, uh, as I say, uh, there are points where the story and the, the emotional arcs between father and son are parallel, but then I think towards the end, they really explode in different directions. And so uh, this is to say, however, that to understand Chaucer's story, I think we need to understand, at least to a certain degree, the father's story. This is also leading me to a discussion of Chaucer and his relationship, the other key relationship in this film, which is that with the young woman, the young girl, Ming. Now, Ming is a really fascinating character, a truly fascinating character, I think. Uh, Tony Raines in his commentary mentions that in his point of view perhaps the weakness of the film is the fact that Ming tends to be somewhat drawn in a way that I would say in my own words in my what I understand Tony Raines to be saying is that uh, she is drawn in a way that she is basically a character uh, uh, with respect to whom the male characters in the film seem to react to towards so there is a certain idealization that occurs with respect to her character in such a way that perhaps the whole characterization of Ming as a character herself becomes somewhat vacant, right? In other words, she is not herself a character, but rather she seems to exist within the narrative for the sake of being reacted to by the men that uh, are in her life and that form the, the circle of, of the cast of characters in this film. So in that sense Ming as a character might seem a little bit elusive or vacant. I'm not sure if I agree with that because well, on the one hand while Ming does uh, seem to know her own effects, uh, how men are affected by her and by her uh, physical uh, beauty, and her sort of allure 
uh, and the effects that she has on men. She seems to understand her power. She also is a, a girl who is very sensible. And this is shown by the fact that she is, remember, when it, when um, uh, toward the end, when she and Chaucer are very close, she's always encouraging him to focus on his studies. And he must study uh, in order to be able to get into uh, you know, a, a good standing with his studies. So it's, she is the one who is encouraging him to study, remember. So she's not necessarily a quote-unquote bad influence. And also she expresses a lot of fierce independence, especially towards the end, at that very last moment before she is ultimately killed. She chastises uh, Chaucer because she uh, accuses him of being just like the others. Uh, you know, that everyone seems to, or at least at least uh, Chaucer and perhaps Honey too, I don't know, they seem to be treating her as being a girl that must be saved. Uh, and the only people who can save them is Chaucer or something. So they have a kind of savior complex when it comes to Ming. But she resists that. She says that that's not the case at all. And there's a certain arrogance uh, that men who have or espouse that view of her as a woman uh, uh, tend to display. I mean, it's a very arrogant point of view, at least the way that she describes it. And so that seems to suggest to me that she is a fierce independence that seems to lash out in a way that is uh, wholly her own. And I think as a character, therefore, she is a very admirable one. And it's just very unfortunate and very tragic that she, uh, that, that, her, uh, the, that her story ends the way it does, because um, it was at the very point where she was at the, 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 the heat or the, the heat of the moment where she was uh, the most uh, passionately expressing her own independence was the point where she died. So uh, it's a very tragic tale. So the relationship, therefore, between Ming and Xiao Sir is the other crucial relationship in the film, in my opinion. And this is very important because... Uh, of course, it forms a, a kind of the, uh, the 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 love interest angle, which ends up becoming the crux of the explosive nature of the film's conclusion. Obviously, it also forms a lot of the um, the motivations of the character of Xiao Sir, especially uh, towards the latter half of the film, uh, right? Because uh, there is a a kind of fascination that he has with Ming. And this is also intertwined with Chaucer's fascination with Honey, and uh, who is the gang leader of the Little Park gang, who comes in uh, around the middle of the film, and then who is therefore uh, later killed off, right, by uh, Shandong, the leader of the 217 gang. And that thus uh, engenders yet another sense of injustice within uh, the heart and soul of Chaucer. Uh, and thus that helps. Uh, motivates him to at least lend some assistance to the uh, to the attack on the 217 gang that occurs around the middle of the film. It's a very violent attack. So, um, uh, so yes, yeah, so all this uh, stuff that seems to center on, let's say, his relationship with Ming and also as it relates peripherally uh, with respect to his relationship with Honey and all the other characters here, I think this forms uh, another... Uh, basis for the uh, ultimate emotional confusion that erupts out of Shao Sir by the film's end. This is very important too because uh, in terms of, uh, of metaphor, uh, remember Ming is, uh, she, her father is dead and she uh, lives with her mother who has an asthmatic condition and right uh, around the 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 latter half of the first part of the film, we see that uh, they have to leave the household where she's working, and they have to go to the 217 area, and so therefore she becomes sort of part of the the um, uh, the, the inner workings of the gang, although she, remember she is the girlfriend of Honey, who is the head of the, the rival gang, the Little Park gang, so there's a little bit of a, of a, of a sort of a, a a cross-gang 
thing going on. I mean, she's not really a member of the 217 gang, but she is uh, there because uh, uh, financial considerations force her to be in the same area. What does that leave the, or what does that leave Shao Sir and his relationship with me? Well, this is the another uh, interesting aspect of Shao Sir's character, right? Because Shao Sir seems to want to control Ming, or she he seems to want to. Well, he's obviously in love with her, or is in, very infatuated by her, and he's also uh, trying to fill in the Honey role because Honey by this time is dead having been killed by the leader of the 217 gang early on. So this is a very important thing. Um, the, and of course, his, uh, uh, her ultimate rejection of him by the end is what causes him ultimately to just snap after a series of stressful events leading up to this climactic event. Um, so... Uh, uh, this is all to say, I think, that uh, maybe the relationship between Ming and Shao Sir, or I should say Shao Sir's perception of Ming is, while valiant and perhaps uh, innocent from uh, Shao Sir's point of view, it's ultimately and very tragically misguided because I think he fundamentally misunderstands who Ming is. And uh, this misunderstanding uh, leads to his downfall. And it's wonderful, too, because the, this idea of misunderstandings uh, that uh, Shao Sir uh, has, it stems not only from his misunderstanding of Ming as a character, but also it stems from his misunderstandings of other events in the film, right? For instance, very early on, it's his... I guess misunderstanding of a certain situation that he sees at the very outset of the film. He thinks he sees Jade, but in fact it's Ming. And this comes back later uh, at the very end of the film when Jade reveals this very crucial piece of information. So this idea, and you know, the idea that uh, uh, um, early on in the film, uh, that uh, Shao Sir said that he saw Jade with Sly, but in fact, Jade reveals later on that it was in fact Ming, not Jade. So, and um, uh, this misunderstanding of the situation that Shao Sir se um, seemed to view, and also this misunderstanding of women from Shao Sir's point of view, is incredibly important because he really doesn't know what's going on. And the more we get into it, the more we realize that he's really losing his grip. What he thought he knew is really not true at all. And this is the great thing about his scene with Jade at the climactic moment of the film, where Jade reveals certain information. Jade reveals this information in a way that reveals her inner intelligence. And this is such a wonderful moment, too, because it shows, at least it shows me, just what a fool I was as a viewer. I always thought up to that moment that Jade was a, uh, uh, perhaps she didn't have a kind of um, uh, perception of the world around her. Well, nothing could be farther from the truth. She is perhaps the smartest character in the film. And it's that revelation which is so uh, astounding to me. I, at that moment, am like Shao Sir. I am just stunned at the uh, level of complete ignorance that I have, and my world is shaken. And so I feel, <laughs> I feel uh, sympathy for Shao Sir because I feel like he's probably in the same boat as I am. Uh, so this idea of perception and what we think is true about our world, uh, and these things can just shatter in an instant. Uh, this is the sort of thing that is at play here, right? And it's not just to do with uh, uh, interpersonal relationships by themselves, although it's very important. This is also to do with everything. And, uh, right, everything is distilled in the single moment, right? And this goes back to the uncertainty and the, the tension that exists 
in Taiwan at this particular time. Everything here is very delicate and very sensitive, and it can break at any moment. It's true for the father's existence. It's true for Xiao Sir. It's true for his perceptions in, uh, of the world around him and how authorities seem to creep in and affect things and affect one's life, uh, both in a positive way, but p possibly also in a negative way. And thus things grow within us as a result of this uh, pressure cooker kind of environment and the tensions grow. And this is all from personal relationships. This is all from the cultural and political position that Taiwan is in. And everything is swirling, uh, starting from a little ripple uh, that uh, are seeds that are planted early on in the film. And they grow into something that becomes truly momentous, gigantic, titanic, uh, true uh, seismic shifts in um, the human condition. And this is all encapsulated. All of it is encapsulated in the experience of Xiao Sir as he encounters these various people. Jade, Ming, his father, um, Lao Er, uh, the sisters, uh, Uncle Fat, um, Sly, Honey, uh, Deuce, uh, Little Cat, um, uh, the teachers at the school, and uh, everything else. Um, uh, the 217 gang members, the other Little Park gang members, everything. All of it is distilling something that is truly uh, a representation of what it is to be uh, uh, in Taiwan, or what it is to be quote-unquote Taiwanese, and whatever that means, right? Whether that means native Taiwanese, or whether that means uh, someone from the mainland who has come and who is living in Taiwan during this very significant and crucial moment in history. Everything is distilled in this very uh, essence of this character, which is Xiao Sir, which is why I think um, this film is something that is both intimate and also something that is truly speaking so many languages. It's emitting so many electrical pulses at once with every single frame that is shown in this film. So, oh my goodness, um, there is uh, a lot here. There's a lot here, that's for sure. And again, I'm definitely not doing this film any justice. Uh, you have to see the film for yourself.